Today we're going to turn to the theory of knowledge and focus on a basic question in epistemology. There are different approaches that people have taken to the question of where our knowledge comes from, what it is for something to couch this knowledge, and one of the families of views goes under the heading of externalism. It's especially plausible for somebody who takes an empiricist approach to philosophy, thinks of knowledge as coming from experience. And well, how does it come from experience? There are various sources of knowledge. So the externalist typically thinks in terms of good knowledge sources, what it is that knowledge is to have information that's come to you in the right way, from the right kind of source. Well, despite that, it's actually a late come to Western philosophy. It wasn't until 1967 that someone actually clearly formulated an externalist theory of knowledge in the West. On the other hand, in Indian philosophy, it has been the main approach to the theory of knowledge for thousands of years. So it's a case where different philosophical cultures tend to ask the same question, and in some cases propose very different answers for a long time. This one especially surprising, given that if we have an empiricist starting point, it's an extremely natural way to think about knowledge. So let's take a look at the question of what knowledge is. What is knowledge? There are some things we can say about it that are utterly uncontroversial. For example, you can't know something unless it's true. Knowledge implies truth. So if I know that it's Monday today, it's got to be Monday today, right? <coughs> Suppose I said to you, I know that today is Tuesday. You'd say, no, you don't. <laughs> what do you mean I don't? Well, it's not Tuesday, it's Monday. Okay. That entire week that started with Labor Day, I was off on what day it was. And actually, one of you complained that you missed class because you thought it was a different day. And I totally get that. I did too. <laughs> I said, how silly you thought it was Tuesday when today's really Monday. And actually, it was Wednesday. <laughs> okay? So the fact has to be right. You can't know it unless it's true. Now, some people will joke. Mark Twain, in fact, famously joked, ah, it's not what they don't know. It's what they know that ain't so. <laughs> Um, but that's using no in a different way, using no in a they feel very confident of. The way we ordinarily use knowledge, we mean it's got to be true. Well, the some, second, a second thing that's almost as uncontroversial, in order to know something, you have to believe it. So if I know that today is Monday, it must be true that it's Monday, but also it must be true that I believe that it's Monday. It would be very weird for me to say, I know today is Monday, but I don't believe it. That'd be weird. Now, I could say it in a kind of expression of shock. You know, you come to me and show me the price tag on this item, and you say, listen, they're selling this for only $9.95. And I say, whoa, I can't believe it. And somebody says, really? Where can I get that inexpensively? And I say, oh, at that place, they're selling it for $9.95. Uh, and you say, I can't believe it. Well, I, no, I can't believe it. But I know it's true. <laughs> OK, but there, when I say, I don't believe it, I'm not literally saying, I know that they're selling it for $9.95, even though I do not believe it. But I'm just saying it's, it's surprising, right? Uh, often when we say, I don't believe it, we really mean that's surprising. Or we'll say, that's incredible. And we don't really mean that's impossible to believe. We just mean it's surprising. I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't see the fact. So if, today is, if I know that today is Monday, it must be Monday, and I've got to believe it's Monday. Well, here's an option. We can say that's what knowledge is, it's just true belief. Now, do you think that's right? Is knowledge just a question of having a belief and having it turn out to be true? Well, could you take the example of like them thinking the earth was flat in the sense that like everyone believed it was true and like that was taken as fact, but it really wasn't? Like, you know. Well, if so, okay, suppose people believe that the earth is flat. It's not enough to make it knowledge, right? It's got to be true, and their belief isn't true. But suppose you've got something that is actually right, uh, and that you believe, does that make it knowledge? Could you be right about something without, without knowing it's true? Yeah. Uh, would that end up having everybody, it would almost kind of seem like knowledge is based on one person's definition of it, because if a round earther were to say that the earth was round and it's kind of flat earthers, they'd be like, oh, they're not knowledgeable, they don't know. It's a common fact that the earth is flat. And so knowledge in that case would be defined as by the person 
Oh, well, all right. Now, it is true that if we disagree about the facts, then we're going to disagree about knowledge, too. For, so, for example, if you say, ha, you think you know that the Earth is round, but ha, ha, I know it's really flat, so <laughs> you're wrong, uh, that could happen, right? People disagree about the facts, and so they disagree about who knows what. Uh, but both are going to say, look, I can't know it unless it's true. In fact, they'll say, that's why you don't have knowledge, because you're wrong about the fact. And so people can disagree about those things. But for now, I want to put aside the question of disagreement and just focus on what it is to know something. We can look and say, well, all right, this person thinks they know, this person thinks they know, but only one can be right. Um, they clearly can't both know this, right? Because it, this person is saying that P, this person is saying that not P. One is saying the Earth is flat, one is saying it's not flat. Only one of them can be right. So at most, one of them can actually know. Yeah? Well, sure. Okay, yes. I can have beliefs that I'm not sure are true. So um, I say to you, I ask you a question about a football game next weekend. I say, you think the Longhorns are going to win their next game? And suppose you say, yes, I think they are. And you turn out to be right. They do win. Does it mean you knew they were going to win? Often we will say, I believe it, but I'm not sure, right? If I say, are you sure they're going to win? How much are you willing to bet? How about this? Bet your life, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, no, look, I, I'm not that sure, right? I'm not that confident. And so there are degrees of certainty. In fact, there are philosophers these days who say, look, thinking in terms of belief isn't actually very helpful. Um, when I was department chair, I actually at some point said, I don't have any beliefs. I just have credences. I just assign things probabilities. I'm not willing to commit myself to anything. Um, and if you have that sort of view, then obviously you can't say something as simple as true belief. It would be something like a true, well, something that you assign high probability to that turns out to be true. So this can get complicated if we think in terms of probabilities and all that. But we certainly want to allow for the possibility that somebody has a belief, even though they're not entirely confident of it. Yeah? Would religious beliefs and knowledge based on that be under that category? Of religious beliefs? Well, um, they could be, right? Suppose somebody believes there is a god. And suppose they're right, there is a god. Does it mean they knew there was a god? Yeah? Well, what I was going to say is, like, smokers know that cigarettes are bad for them, but it's like they keep on doing it because they don't quite believe that it's going to happen to them until, like, you know, something tragic happens to them. So is that kind of how this would apply? Like, it's oh. almost like they know it, but they don't want to believe it, so they just keep on doing it until, like, that's an interesting point. Something We've talked a little bit about this problem of weakness of will. We're going to talk a lot more about it. And so you could think, what about the person who says, yes, I know smoking is bad for me, but continues to smoke? Do they really believe it? Um, we're going to come back to that question. Aristotle actually is going to say, uh, you know, <laughs> there's a sense in which they believe it and a sense in which they don't. And so he will end up saying it's a little complicated here because the fact is, some people say things that they believe, or, but then their actions indicate they don't really believe it. And so he says at one point, they're really reciting lines like an actor on a stage, or like somebody who is asleep or drunk. <laughs> um, they're saying the right words, but they're not really believing that at the time. And you're right, in that way it's going to be complicated. We think about the person who's weak-willed and what they actually know or even believe in that context, and it's going to look messy and complicated. Yeah. I think with smoking, they believe that it's bad for them. It's like, you, you know, the knowledge, but uh, it's addiction. You know? so well, so uh, that's what they do. Yeah, uh, good. You're all focusing on the belief part of it, and basically focusing on the complexity of somehow figuring out what somebody really believes. And that's a fair point. But in a certain sense, this is just going to transfer to the knowledge question. We're still not getting at the question of whether it's reasonable to define knowledge as true belief. Yes? I was, uh, I was thinking that maybe a smoker, um, sorry, maybe a smoker would, uh, um, would refuse to believe or the brain would have let him believe because the moment he believed that he put his life in danger, it would tear him apart on the inside emotionally or something. So he's forcing himself not to believe. Um, and so for him, the long term purpose, because he knows he's going to be fine, because if he knew anything else, he would be able to live with himself. Oh, no, 
now we're getting into self-deception and Freud and all of that. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to stop talking about this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the reason is really that I mean all these are fair points, but they're really focusing on the complexity of figuring out what to say about belief and cases where what somebody says and what they do are in conflict with one another. And that's a reasonable point, a good thing to worry about. But in a sense, it's beside the point when we're thinking about def definitions of knowledge. We need to figure out what the relationship is between knowledge and belief. Even if there are lots of complexities about belief, they're going to transfer to knowledge too, uh, in a sense. But they don't, they don't help us with this question. Yeah? Why does knowledge have to come from belief? It can come from experience as well, right? Well, oh, I'm not saying knowledge comes from belief. Here we're, we're going to focus on, in a minute, uh, I hope, eventually, <laughs> on where knowledge comes from. Here I'm just saying, look, knowledge is really a kind of belief. It's believing, and here the proposed definition, it's believing something true. Okay? You know it if you believe it and it's true. Now here's the kind of case that Plato focuses on and worries about. Um, suppose you've got a judge. And the defendant is there, let's say they waive the right to a jury trial, they're dependent on the judge. And the judge forms an opinion based on something irrelevant. Let's say it's a racist judge. And so the judge looks and forms a judgment about the person on the basis of their race and concludes they're guilty. Now suppose, and let's suppose that this judge really does believe it. This judge isn't aware of being a racist, isn't aware of coming to the conclusion for that reason and so thinks that person is guilty. But an outsider will look and say, this is a question of bias. Well, the person has the belief. And let's suppose it's true. Let's suppose the person did it. It is actually guilty. Then does that judge know that person's guilty? Plato says, no. <laughs> OK, they turn out to be right, but they've got the wrong reason in mind. They're motivated by the wrong reason. That doesn't count as knowledge. Now, think about other cases where somebody has a belief, but they believe it, as it were, for the wrong reason for the thing that doesn't make it true. So it might be a case of bias or prejudice in this sort of instance, but there are lots and lots of other things that make people believe something or not believe something. For example, somebody tells you something, and you might believe it because you like that person. Uh, this is, in a way, the moral <laughs> or the central motivating point of advertising. They put somebody on TV, and that person says, hey, this is a great kind of car. And if you like that person, you're more likely to think it's true that that's a great kind of car. Now, is that a good reason for thinking it's a great kind of car? Matthew McConaughey said so. Uh, <laughs> right? You might really like Matthew McConaughey. And you say, yeah, he was there at the Longhorn game. I mean, what's not to like? And he's a great actor and all of this. And so he says, this is a great kind of car. And so do you say, oh, that's a, I mean, let's say it is a great kind of car. Okay, you form the belief, uh, belief on the basis of his appearing in the commercials, and it turns out that's true. Do you know? You might not know anything about cars, right? You just, let's say, have never thought about it much. You just think, hey, I got my first job with my great UT philosophy degree. <laughs> I'm going to go out and buy a nice car. What's a nice car? <coughs> oh, I remember those commercials. That's a nice car. Uh, that's something that, you might say, doesn't really count as knowledge. It's a true belief. But it's not knowledge because what? Something's missing, right? You don't have the reason that would make it knowledge. Yeah? I, it becomes knowledge when you have maybe an awareness of the proof. So there's like, it could be true that you believe it, but you don't have awareness of the proof and all those things fall into place, then it becomes knowledge. Okay, good. You might need the proof. You might need the argument, some reasons, right? Some justification. And so, Plato says, look, beliefs can be true accidentally. People can get the things right for the wrong reason. And so you've got to actually have a better reason. <laughs> now, whatever that thing to be added is, whether it's justification or proof or um, reasons or evidence or something, it's something that philosophers call warrant. And so we might think of it this way. Knowledge is truth plus, plus belief plus warrant. And now we're going to have to figure out what warrant is. Yeah. So if like, or at least to me, the majority of knowledge that we know today is designed by man or has been created and symbolized by the human race. So like, in the absence of man, how do we know that the knowledge that we design is actually true? Or at least... Ah, so yeah, how do we know something really is knowledge? After all, we are the ones who put together, put, put together. We are the ones who put together concepts, 
and try to actually come up with theories, for example. How do we do that? And how do we know that we actually do know things? Well, it's really a question in part of what this warrant is. What is our warrant for things we know? Um, let's say, by definition, knowledge is going to be warranted true belief. What does this warrant look like? Well, there are two broad approaches to this. One says it's something internal. It's something about the reasons I could give, the other beliefs I have, and the way it stands in connection with those beliefs. So for example, you might say it's a question of having a certain proof in mind, having some, some reasoning, having an argument for this. Um, Plato at one point says it's true belief with an account, with an account of why it's true. And so you might think it has to do with something internal to us, the kind of mental state that we are in, the way in which that belief, let's say, connects to other beliefs, other things inside the mind. But you also might think it's something external. It has to do with the connection between your belief, your mental state, and the world. An internalist is somebody who thinks that warrant is purely an internal matter, having that belief connected to other beliefs in the right way. And an externalist thinks, no, warrant is a question of having the right relationship between your belief and the world. Yeah? Um, I'm a little unclear as to what exactly a warrant is. Are we going to discuss that later? Before? Yeah, exactly. In a sense, the question is just, what is warrant? Right now, it's a blank check. We, we sort of said, yeah, true belief isn't enough because these beliefs can be true accidentally or for the wrong reason. And so let's think instead about, uh, let's think instead about, well, whatever it is that has to be added to true belief. And at the moment, warrant is just a place. It's just that whatever else is required. So what is it and what does it look like? Here is my picture that's trying to make this clearer. Why I thought this made everything clearer, I'm not sure. Um, but good, we've got two kittens there playing in a car. Okay? It's a toy car. I mean, it's a Barbie car. It's not a real car. But anyway, <laughs> they'd be really large kittens if that were a real car. Uh, but now, we've got a kitten inside the car, right? So you look at that and you say, oh, there is kitten Genie inside the car. So you have a belief. And the belief is that sort of star shaped thing in your mind over there. You form a belief that there's a kitten in the car, and the belief is true. Here is the actual photograph that shows at one point the kitten was in the car. Actually, that cat is now large and fat, so she wouldn't fit in that car anymore. But now, <clears throat> okay, there's a kitten in the car. The question is, what is the connection between the world and my belief, or between my belief and other things in my mind, that makes this a bit of knowledge, that makes it warranted. Well, the internalist says, look for other things in the mind. That's why I've got that line going back from the belief at a question mark. The internalist says, look inside the mind to figure out whether this belief is warranted. The externalist says, no, 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 look at the relationship between the belief and the world. Now, there's already one kind of relationship, namely that the belief is true. The person who is an externalist will say it's something else that has to do with the connection to the world besides truth. So here's the externalist view. That bit of warrant, the additional thing you need, is not something inside the head. It is not a proof or a justification or a reason or an account or something like that. Instead, it's something external. We already know that this belief has to be true. And the externalist says there's moreover some other connection to the world it has to have in order to count as knowledge. Now, since right now we know that it's a belief and we know that it's true, and the future is something we may or may not be able to know, what is there for us to be able to talk about? Well, it's not a question of how that belief relates to the world now. It's a question of its history. Did it arise in the right way? Did it have the right connection in the world? When did you get the belief? How did you get the belief? And was it in a way that we could expect to lead to truth. So the externalist here is trying to say there's a relationship to the world. It's got to be true, but also that truth can't be accidental. It can't be just a matter of dumb luck. And says the reason is it came about. It arose from your interaction with the world in the right kind of way. Yeah? But if you were to have a false word, is it, it arose from something, but then you find out that the, the source from that wasn't accurate? OK, good. You could find out that the source is inaccurate. For example, there are websites 
that exists purely to propagate fake news, okay? And um, I, I did not even know these existed until a while ago when one of them said that Clint Eastwood is moving to New Braunfels. And it, was, it looked very convincing. It, was, it looked just like a local TV station or something. And it's a totally bogus website. There is no such TV station. Uh, and so on. And these exist all over the place. They're purely there. I mean, some of these are political and all of that, but here I don't mean anything political. It's just like some people set these up and they put out fake news just to attract clicks and then they sell ads. So any of you could do this. As long as you could start a website and, you know, your local station, KTXQ, in, you know, wherever it is, and you just put out all this ridiculous news and people click on it and they share it on Facebook. And the advertiser is advertising your site because you're getting all these clicks. And the more outrageous things you say, the more clicks you'll get and all of this. But anyway, so you, you go to one of these sites, you say, well, hey, KTXQ says that blah, 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 blah. And then you find out, wait, this is a terrible source of knowledge. This is people making up outrageous stuff. So you're going to or I actually had a friend who didn't understand what the onion was. <laughs> and so people would share onion things on Facebook, you know, to this uh, funny website. And they would start arguing. They say, oh, that's an outrageous thing. It's not true at all. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's a joke, OK? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, they could find out, look, that's a bad source of knowledge. Or you might have a friend who's a great friend in a lot of ways, but you gradually find out that person just lies all the time. I have a friend like that. <laughs> OK, that person tells a lot of lies. And after a while, you just realize, OK, don't trust whatever that person says. They don't tell malicious lies. I mean, they aren't mean lies. They're just kind of random lies. Oh, yeah, I talked to that guy about that. And then you talk to that person, I haven't seen that dude in years. <laughs> huh. And, you know, and once you would, well, anyway, never mind. But the point is, <laughs> you, you find out that source isn't very reliable. So actually, that's the key point. Is the source, is the way in which this arose a reliable source of knowledge or not? Is it something that reliably leads to true beliefs? So, the externalist idea is that to distinguish knowledge from other mental states, like mere belief, we've got to invoke these relationships between our mental states and the world, and the idea is how those beliefs were formed, how they arose, and we want it to happen according to a reliable method. Basically, we want a reliable means of belief formation. And so if we're thinking about sources like news sources, some are a lot more reliable than others. You're going to count as knowing it if your information comes from a reliable source. And it's true. If, on the other hand, you read it in an Onion article, and then it turns out actually to be true, we're going to say, well, that doesn't count as knowledge. Okay, That wasn't a reliable source. That's actually a website that's meant to be funny, not to really the truth. Notice this isn't necessarily transparent to you, because you can't tell frequently how reliable that source is. Is your friend really reliable or not? It takes a while to figure that out. And the same thing with various news sources. Some are obviously unreliable and are meant to be jokes, but lots of things purport to be reliable, and it takes time to figure out what who's telling me the truth. So here's the idea. Knowledge, from an externalist point of view, is really a true belief that's produced by a reliable process. Okay, It's something that arises in a reliable way. What I mean by that is just that the process is reliable. It is likely to lead to truth. If the process is one that reliably leads you to true beliefs. So that's what we could say about this. A reliable process produces mostly true beliefs when applied in normal situations, when used normally. Now, we've got to put that in because there can be things that trick even the most reliable sources. Okay, um, There are things that will fool your eyes, things that will fool your ears, things that will fool even the best reporters, and so on. And so this is something that we can't insist on you know, perfect reliability. It's got to be reliable enough, normally reliable in normal situations. So what are the sources of knowledge? What are sources that are like that? that reliably lead us to true beliefs in normal situations. Scientific method. Ah, oh, one suggested is scientific method. OK, scientific method is one such source of knowledge. It's actually a highly complex, you might say, family of sources of knowledge. But yeah, scientific method is one. We could say that scientific method is something that is normally reliable. Not to say scientists are perfect. It doesn't always lead to the right result. Um, 
But on the other hand, it reliably produces true beliefs. What about math? What about mathematics? Mathematics is something that is a good source of knowledge. Yeah. A dictionary. A dictionary. OK, good. A dictionary is a reliable source of knowledge about what words mean. Yeah. Prestigious news sources. OK, there are at least some news sources that are highly reliable. Uh, professional on a certain thing. Good, a professional in a certain area. Let's say you talk to your doctor about medicine, or you talk to a meteorologist about the weather, or to a philosopher about life. <laughs> um, I should be honored that none of you thought that was funny. Good. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's something that is, you know, experts are generally reliable sources of knowledge. Yeah. Universal agreement. Okay, good. If everybody agrees that something is true, doesn't guarantee it's truth. But on the other hand, you might think that's fairly reliable. So let's take a look at some possibilities here. I want to turn to the account of externalism that we find in India. There are two Hindu schools of thought. They're known as darshanas. Nyaya, which means logic, and Vaisheshika, which means particularism. They merged around the year 1000 in the work of a philosopher known as Udayana to form a school known as Nyaya Vaisheshika. <laughs> okay? Now, these are tongue twisters, I realize, for many of you. <laughs> Their proponents are called Nyayakas, which is a great word for word. I mean, for one thing, it's fun to say, Nyaya. Uh, and for another, you can call somebody that, and they won't know what you've called them, right? Somebody says, well, it didn't look that way to me. To me, you say, oh, what a Nyayaka. <laughs> it sounds like an insult, but actually, it's a term of praise, at least as I would use it. Anyway, the earliest work is the Nyaya Sutra by Gautel, and it was written in about the year 2000. Sorry, 200. <laughs> 200! <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, let me say that again. The earliest work was written by Gautel in about the year 200. Okay, the key concept in the Nyaya Sutra is a pramana. A pramana is a source of knowledge. It's a legitimate source of knowledge, so a reliable one, one that reliably leads to true beliefs, normally. And here are the ones that are recognized within this theory. Now, there might be others, and there might be amalgamations of these. I think of scientific method as a way of putting several of these together. But the first one is perception. Sometimes we know things because we see them. How do you know there are people in this room? You perceive them. Okay, so perception is a means of knowledge. Secondly, inference. You can infer some things from things that you see. So you might do this through logic. Mathematics consists largely of inference. Um, scientific method involves inference. But there are lots of very simple forms of inference. How do you know that there are people in the room? Well, because you see these particular people in the room. And you say, uh, that person's in the room. So somebody's in the room. Um, analogy. We can learn things by analogy. And especially in the Indian context, or in this Indian theory, we learn how to new, use new words by analogy. And then finally, from reliable testimony. Testimony from reliable sources. So knowledge is just true belief that's produced by a reliable means of knowledge. Knowledge is a true belief you get from a pramana, a legitimate source of knowledge. So let's talk about each of these. Perception. Here is Sutra 4. Perception is the cognition resulting from sense object concept which is not due to words, invariably related to the object of a definite character. Now, what does that mean? Well, I perceive things that are, first of all, re resulting from sense-object contact. So I see the thing, I hear it, I feel it, I taste it, I smell it. It's not merely due to words. So how do I know that a person is a person? <laughs> That's just due to words. That's not something I have to perceive. But knowing that a person is sitting in the chair in front of me, that's something that I can perceive. And it's related to the object. It is of a definite character. So the related to the object, um, it arises not through hallucination or some bizarre means, but actually from the object. And it has a definite character. Okay, It might be that I see that, well, for example, I take off my glasses. And somebody says, what's that shape in the back of the room? Without my glasses on, I have no idea. Now, if I put my glasses on, I can see, ah, that's the thing that is the uh, hydraulic 
thing that keeps the door from slamming shut. Okay, it's a little thing in the back near the door. But without my glasses on, I just see a kind of fuzzy gray shape. I couldn't tell you what that was. And so then the perception has to be definite enough for me to actually gain knowledge from. So the idea is perceptions are reliable process. Now, it's not to say we don't suffer from illusions. We do. But we perceive most things accurately when we use our sense organs in the right way in normal situations. Well, the same thing is true of inference. We normally get things right. Some inferences actually guarantee what we know, like deductive inferences. The truth of the conclusion is guaranteed if we infer things deductively. If it's inductive, oh yeah, I got examples, but we have now no seconds left. Ah! OK, there are different kinds of inference. There are different kinds of other things. But the last thing I want to just ask you is, are there others besides these four? Think about that. We'll return to the question next time.